Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session um, called Betting on Moonshots. It seems like a timely and important conversation. And what we're hoping to do today is to explore some of the shifts and changes that are happening with different levels of engagement from uh, different actors, but also different approaches between the public and private sector actors in terms of betting on really frontier breakthrough science and technology projects. And uh, what we're hoping to do is, of course, uh, get some different perspectives from across that landscape, um, explore some opportunities where some of the interests might be a little bit misaligned, but I think more importantly, look for opportunities where we can create alignment and uh, hopefully accelerate our collective efforts. And we're really lucky in that we're, uh, we have some fantastic panelists from uh, literally across that spectrum uh, to share their views with us today. And I will introduce them briefly in the order that they, they will be speaking to us, and then, uh, and then we'll jump right in. Uh, so first, Jean-Pierre Bourgneau, who is uh, the uh, president of the European Research Council. He's a mathematician, and he's played leading roles in the European innovation ecosystem for many, many years. Um, Yachun Zeng, who's the president of Baidu, um, came to Baidu with a strong corporate record, but I think it's also fair to say is very active in some of the world's leading academic research institutions and very interested in that part of the food chain as well. Uh, Marshall Hebert, who's a computer scientist with European roots, but uh, now find himself at the very distinguished uh, uh, robotics laboratory at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, welcome. Andrew Fursman, who's uh, our entrepreneur on the panel with very eclectic interests, all the way from economics to microbiology to quantum computing. Um, and he leads a company called OneCubit uh, in Canada. And then last but not least, Shirley Ann Jackson, who's the president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, um, a physicist by training uh, who's had many leading roles in both public, private, government, um, and, uh, and also serves on the board of the World Economic Forum Foundation. So uh, welcome to all of you. Our panelists have committed that they will answer the question we are posing in this debate. Is the revival of corporate-led research helping or hindering scientific progress? And before we get their opinions, maybe we can do a quick show of hands. Who in the audience says, Revival of corporate-led research is helping scientific progress. Raise your hand if you believe that's the case. Hindering? <laughs> so we're not sure, maybe, on that last piece, because I see many people haven't voted. So let's see if there's a shift at the end of, of this conversation. The way we're going to run the conversations, we'll get some brief remarks from each of our panelists and then uh, cl any clarifications. We will also open it up for questions from the audience and then uh, do a little bit of a wrap up at the end, um, if that makes sense. Jean-Pierre, over to you. Thank you very much for <coughs> the invitation and the opportunity to say a few things on this. For, I think uh, I'm here, of course, representing the, the point of view of a public uh, funding agency. So the European Research Council is the one of the programs of uh, the European Commission with the duty of uh, pushing research to their boundaries. That is really to try to bet on moonshots and actually uh, we're leaving full freedom to the researchers. So it's a totally bottom-up mm -hmm. program. And uh, from that point of view, I think we are very pleased that uh, so the European Research Council has been up and running since 2007. So now we support people for five years, which for us is very important. If you want researchers to take care really an um, ambitious view, you need them to give them freedom and yeah. time. There is no other way. And we have just uh, conducted the evaluation of the first Finnish project, because mm -hmm. we now have some in store. And uh, we're very pleased to see that uh, with a completely independent panel, that 21% uh, of these projects were considered breakthroughs and 50% major scientific advance. So we felt, uh, in a sense, that part of the mission we were received was, was taken. Second part, to connect to your question more directly, one program that the Scientific Council, which has the responsibility of the European Research Council, which has the responsibility of uh, setting up uh, the, the, the way the, uh, the ERC is functioning, has decided to have a, what we call the 
really a, a program which we call the proof of concept, mm -hmm. which for us is uh, if researchers along the way see a possibility of branching off to, towards something more connected to industrial activities or societal challenges, we accompany them along the way. And uh, this has proved quite successful. It's not a huge amount of money, it's a bonus we give them, but it has proved to be a good proof uh, that their business model is viable. And then we found some funders who are interested in that. And uh, to connect now really very directly with this idea of having private investors to come, uh, this has been the basis for us to also start something which was completely unexpected, which is some kind of cooperation with uh, IBAN, which is the European Business Angel Network. And actually, we even made visits to the European Investment Bank with IBAN people to accompany their efforts to maybe uh, shift the investment, uh, which was mainly loans toward more uh, private equity, and which, of course, is not our responsibility. But we felt, because the uh, investors were interested because of this very long-term uh, project that people have been pushing, very ambitious project, and they felt that some of them were really the type that, as private investors, they would be interested in. Hmm. Yes, John? Uh, very glad to be here to join this uh, distinguished uh, panel. Uh, so my view is certainly the corporate R&D you know, helps uh, the advance of the scientific research, absolutely. <laughs> so let me offer three points. There are always three points. I don't know which three, but always three points. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, first of all, you know, corporate uh, R&D itself uh, is uh, a significant contributor to a lot of uh, uh, the you know, science and technology and breakthroughs, especially in the last uh, you know, five to, to 10 years. Uh, it also is uh, a huge source of uh, funding right, for universities and of course for the corporate itself. Um, and I, I use uh, the two companies I work for as example. You know, some of, you know, most of uh, you know, my views are in the context of uh, you know, computer science, uh, you know, internet, uh, information technology, but I think this uh, also probably applies to other fields as well. Um, you know, Microsoft, uh, I worked there for 16 years. In fact, I started the, the research lab in, in Beijing and in Asia. 15% uh, of Microsoft's uh, you know, revenue uh, is in R&D, and, uh, and a large portion that actually goes to fundamental research. Uh, Baidu, yeah, I joined Baidu about two years ago, uh, uh, you know, has uh, about 15%, maybe 16%. So uh, last year, a billion renminbi, RMB, uh, going to an R&D. Uh, so it's a lot of commitment, not <coughs> only from the, the US company, but also Chinese companies uh, to uh, invest for the future, for innovation. Uh, lots of uh, you know, the, the technologies, uh, like quantum computing, uh, computer security, uh, you know, media compression, uh, obviously you know, AI, uh, machine learning, lots of you know, computer vision, all those things uh, have a strong uh, roots, uh, obviously from academia, but also from uh, uh, the, uh, the corporations. Uh, so my second point is um, uh, a lot of uh, the research actually can be best performed in a corporate context, especially in you know, AIs, uh, you know, robotics, uh, and computer visions. Uh, it's, you know, uh, the, all the research requires uh, massive data, requires a lot of uh, computational you know, power, you know, huge clusters. And it's pretty hard to do that just from academia. Uh, and also a lot of this data need to be real time and, and just in a, a quantity. I can, it's hard to imagine ever before. Uh, take us, for example, you know, every day there are five billion queries in our search engine, over 20 billion location API calls, and we collect a vast amount of data, mm -hmm. and we build a, the world's largest uh, uh, cluster, computing cluster, uh, with uh, a, a hybrid of uh, you know, uh, CPUs and GPUs uh, and FPGAs or ASICs, those capacity can hardly be uh, produced by universities, academia. Uh, my third point is actually, I don't see conflicts. <laughs> in fact, uh, for all those years, uh, you know, I was in academia, I worked for the US company, worked for a Chinese company, uh, in basic research, uh, in, in a product development, and also uh, work with a lot of uh, uh, the researchers in different fields. 
And, and I think it all worked together quite well. Uh, you know, when I was in Microsoft, we funded uh, a lot of uh, professors. Uh, and you know, uh, Baidu, we do this, the same thing. Uh, and obviously, research, uh, they were different. For universities, more on the you know, fundamental, long-term, uh, curiosity-driven. Uh, corporate is more you know, with the purpose, uh, and uh, we want to make sure uh, you know, we tackle real-world problems, and it has results in uh, the next uh, three years, five years, or maybe 10 years. Uh, but you know, all parties actually work together extremely, extremely well. Uh, so let me just uh, stop there. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, uh, so absolutely, it helps, and, and we need to all work together. Wonderful, optimistic view. Marshall, your institution has been a little bit in the spotlight um, recently, so. Indeed, let, let me elaborate a little bit on, the, on these points. Uh, I also will uh, focus more on the uh, AI learning uh, robotics type of areas, but this applies to other fields as well. Um, I think there are three, um, uh, three uh, pillars, basically, in the collaboration between academia and uh, industry. Uh, ideas, people, and resources. Now, it used to be that, um, some years ago, uh, the collaboration was mostly at the level of ideas. Uh, just to, as a caricature, just to simplify uh, in the interest of time, uh, academia was doing a longer uh, time scale uh, research, what we used to call basic research. Uh, corporate would do uh, shorter term research and basically share the ideas that were produced from, uh, from academia. Now, what we've seen over the past few years is a massive disruption of, of this um, uh, balance, mm -hmm. uh, where what becomes more important, and in fact, in some cases, the most important part is people and skills. The reason being, as you just said, that there is more and more of what we used to call basic research in those fields that is migrated to uh, yeah. uh, corporate, to industry, and is being uh, uh, executed in industry. As a result, industry needs the people, the talent, the skills to execute that, uh, that work. This creates tension between academia and corporate. Uh, this is something that uh, has to be addressed uh, um, including uh, with uh, government, uh, to find new ways of collaborating. For example, things that we call shared entities, where now we have direct collaboration through embedding of uh, industry in uh, university, et cetera, uh, finding new collaboration, uh, new collaboration uh, models. And the third part, which you mentioned uh, already a little bit, has to do with uh, access to resources. Uh, and in particular, the data that you mentioned, and I would say it in a stronger way even, is that we are looking at certain areas of research that just cannot be done in academia anymore at all. And I don't mean by that what we call applied research or toward uh, you know, product development or something like that, but things that are close to what we used to call fundamental research. And the reason is that many areas of research require the scale of data that only uh, companies like Facebook, Google, or Baidu uh, uh, have. So we need to find new ways to collaborate, new ways to uh, share and access uh, this kind of, those kind of resources, which is of course difficult because of proprietary issues, also privacy issues, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, so for, because of those uh, disruption, the uh, people versus ideas, the need to access resources, we need to find new models to, uh, to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Andrew, what does it look like from the front lines? <laughs> well, my company is much smaller, um, but uh, we are really interested in this idea of we can have very powerful things like quantum computers, um, but we need to have people connect those to the real world problems that they can solve. And so the research that we do is really about how do we take the amazing technology that's coming out of um, corporate research and academia and be able to connect that to um, the problems that need to be solved in industry and uh, elsewhere, or elsewhere outside of academia. One of the things that's been uh, very exciting for us is seeing this as really a big part of a larger ecosystem of research where, for example, we have hired many people coming out of their PhDs and their postdocs um, out of Canadian institutions. And so, um, you know, we're, we're based in Vancouver, British Columbia, and although our uh, obligation as a corporation is to our shareholders to maximize value, um, and certainly all of the things that we're trying to do are to capture value in this space where we feel there's a really exciting opportunity. Um, we've seen this technology emerge over the last five years. We think it's going to really explode over the next. 
Um, but you need to have people who are capable of being able to understand this technology um, with the background that comes from studying at higher educational institutions. Um, and now to be able to come in and, and think about specific ways that this can be applied to generate revenue to take this from an idea and to make it into something really valuable. Um, but I think that that value isn't just encapsulated by the shareholders, by the private organizations. If you think about from the perspective of um, Vancouver as a city, you know, this is great to be able to have people who go to school there continue to make their homes there and to have opportunities to be based in a community doing the same type of work that they've studied for all of their lives. Um, but at the national level, you know, this technology could be really impactful in a way that um, having you know, left the country would be a huge uh, missed opportunity for, for Canada. And so we see ourselves as bringing some private funding from our investors, but also engaging at the national level. Canada has something called the Scientific Research and Experimental Development Tax Credits, um, which allow us to take a portion of the money that we spend in research and to be able to, uh, to get that back so we can do more research per dollar. But we also have programs that allow us to work with educational institutions and will reward us for our hiring people that are coming out, basically trained researchers, in order to put them to work doing the same things that they've been doing. Um, there's not just one qubit and, and our work in quantum computing, but because of these incentives, there have been other companies that have stayed here really interesting organizations doing things like uh, fusion research or hardware development for quantum computers are, are two that come to mind mm -hmm. in Vancouver. Um, and I feel like the really important thing is just getting that research done and getting the, uh, the brilliant minds put to work doing exciting and challenging things that bring benefits both to private and public sides. Uh, and I think that this is something that's not necessarily at tension, um, but really more of a collaboration. And interesting to think of these moonshot opportunities almost as a way to uh, create stickiness to your, your top talent uh, from an economic development perspective. Well, people certainly like to work on the types of challenges that they've been dedicating themselves to and being able to come out of school and to really focus on some of these yeah. things and stay within the communities that you've really developed. I think that's a huge benefit for everyone. Yeah. Surely. <laughs> well, thank you. It's always difficult to be the last, but I'm nonetheless privileged to be here. Now, I've actually had the opportunity to work in one of the great industrial research laboratories, alas, no longer so, but Bell Labs, and uh, spawned many uh, uh, innovative things, m many discoveries, 14 uh, Nobel Prizes along the way. I've also been a professor and I'm now uh, president of a university but I've been in government as well, and I've had the chance to advise our president as a member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. So having said all of that, I mean, I was in a way uh, glad to hear from my uh, uh, fellow participants because it's not either or, but I tend to think of it, uh, we all have our organizing principles in terms of what I call RFPs, resources, focus, and persistence. And so typically, if you've looked at uh, uh, corporations, uh, corporations, if they're large enough, have money. Uh, they certainly um, have data. They have knowledge that comes from the, market, from the marketplace. Uh, they certainly have focus, uh, but men, much of it business-driven uh, for shareholders and so forth. And the persistence relates to what it is they want. And, and what the milestones are that matter. And I'm on some corporate boards, I understand that full well. Universities have as the greatest resources, human resources, human capital. Uh, certainly uh, there's focus. In some ways the focus can be diffuse because uh, faculty and students work across a broad <laughs> front. But they are very focused in the areas in which they have expertise and persistence can be represented by a career. Uh, a faculty member can spend a career in a particular arena. So how do the two things then link? Mm -hmm. They link because in fact, uh, it's not a one-way street. And it's certainly not a one-way street anymore. Um, you know, we, 
there's a lot of work uh, having to do with the mapping of the human genome. If there wasn't fundamental work early on in molecular biology and genetics with understanding DNA, we wouldn't be uh, where we are. On the other hand, the mapping of the genome required uh, uh, DNA sequencing, and that actually was sponsored by someone early on who had made a fortune in business. Uh, without quantum mechanics, there would not be uh, quantum computers because the whole idea of superposition of states comes directly out of uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, problems that relate to the real world provide a kind of focus that can drive real moonshots. Now, you spoke about moonshots. It turns out that one of my predecessors as president of Rensselaer actually ran the Apollo program. He was the operational director that put man on the moon. But when that uh, challenge was put out there, and in this case it came from government, it caused a great mobilization and education of people mm -hmm. in math and science and created a whole generation of people uh, who actually then did a lot of the work that the very technologies that we talk about today uh, were built upon. And so in the end, the real RFP is based on collaboration and partnership. The real P is partnership. The, the real focus comes from uh, both serendipity, that is what people wish to pursue on their own, but also uh, strategic uh, issues and problems that may come out of business. And, and then the resources are the combined ones. But I always like to remind people that there is no innovation without innovators. There is no discovery without discoverers. And that's why I'm delighted that in this meeting, we do have the global young scientists here as we have the entrepreneurs and the innovators because in the end, the real P is partnership. And we in fact have, uh, and it's not you know, unlike some of the robotics work that uh, has gone on at Carnegie Mellon, where we have a great partnership with, for instance, IBM to de develop a cognitive and immersive systems laboratory that brings artificial intelligence and cognitive systems together with human scale immersive environments for group decision making and how that has to happen. But that requires fundamental work in computer science, computer engineering, even bringing in the arts, cognitive science, et cetera. And so to me, that's where the excitement really is. And, and I would not like us to lose sight of that. So let's, let's step maybe a little bit uh, above the, the you know, um, mechanics and I think efficiency that is evolving in terms of public-private collaboration um, between corporations and academic centers. I think, I think we're getting better at that and I think there are lots of mechanisms now. Let's, let's focus on moonshots. Um, what is the big win in the moonshot? Is it inspiration? Is it opening up whole new fields? Is it opening up new markets? Is it uh, improving quality of life for humanity? How should those be catalyzed? Um, and, and what is the shifting role of the private sector in particular? Because we are certainly seeing the private sector increasingly placing very, very large bets. Um, on you know, what, what previously we might have thought of as, as longer term, um, more discovery type research. Any thoughts there? Well, Who's the uh, boss of moonshots? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think first of all, I think we, um, we have to be very careful that uh, never forget that there's a huge diversity in the research. Yeah. And because um, first of all, what is a pertinent size of a group uh, to do research, critical size, varies very much. I mean, uh, I'm a mathematician and definitely some mathematicians work really uh, lonely to make you really change the landscape. And of course, then after that, many, many people c came in and there were really a lot of collaboration. But there are other fields in which uh, you cannot achieve anything without thousands of people. And sometimes these thousands of people do come from the corporate sector, but sometimes, like CERN, they come also from the public sector. So I think we have to keep in mind this huge diversity. Yeah. So therefore, if you want to come up with a recipe for 
uh, moonshot uh, discoveries, then uh, you are in trouble because uh, there will be many recipes. Maybe you need a, a cookbook. That's the <laughs> right thing to, to have. And so, but this being said, I think uh, one f something which for me is extremely important is uh, not to uh, give uh, too strong drivers too early. And uh, at the moment, in a number of uh, circles, both pr public and private, uh, the, the, the emphasis is put a lot on impact. And of course, I completely understand why, because people want to deliver, and both on the private sector or on the public sector. But for me, it's extremely important that we care about impact, but maybe that we don't use systematically impact as criteria for choosing the project. And a very good example, which I <coughs> tend to repeat uh, recently, has been what happened with a uh, CRISPR case nine, as you know, which was developed over the years by different groups of people yeah. with absolutely no intention of any application. Just the purpose was to develop some new uh, understanding on how the uh, microbes were functioning. And then finally, it ended up being a, an extraordinary efficient gene, uh, in, in gene engineering process. And, and therefore, one has to be careful that if you insist too early on this stage, actually, this will never happen. Because very often you need to have a basic understanding because you, before you can see some avenues where you can branch off to other things. Mm -hmm. So this is also a lesson, I think, to be learned, namely that you have to have mechanism in place that is as soon as this becomes possible to have these avenues that people can take them. But uh, if you insist that if you don't offer an avenue, you should not be funded, it would be a disaster. Mm -hmm. So it's almost the opposite of prizes, where the target is very clear. Well, Marshall. another aspect of Moonshot and, and the world of Moonshot is the ability to uh, unify uh, technologies or research threads that yeah. would be otherwise separated and siloed. So one example uh, is a Moonshot that would have to do with uh, feeding the world or improving food production. Uh, one has obvious uh, areas of research that would be related to this moonshot, but it turns out that there are areas of research that go much further than the obvious, uh, including things with data mining, uh, machine learning, robotics, mm -hmm. etc. And combining those, forcing, uh, a forcing function, basically, to combine those together and thinking how we can combine all aspects of technology together is very important. Yeah. Okay. Now, if we're really talking about, you know, scientific progress, scientific progress, then it is fine to pose the question or even a challenge. But what cannot be posed a priori is the pathway. And because that's what real mm -hmm. research is about and that's where real scientific progress comes. And so I think as long as one is careful about that, yeah. um, that a lot can, can come from having a great challenge. It could relate to the brain and brain science. Uh, you know, it could relate to addressing issues having to do with food or food, energy, water, that nexus. But I think it's important to understand that scientific progress is different than trying to develop a specific technology. The one can lead to the other, mm -hmm. but, and, and it can work both ways but one cannot dictate the pathway. Well, what I, what I love about the idea of, uh, of the moonshot is, I mean, first of all, um, we got to the moon. So this is something that, you know, we, it's a specific goal that you can push towards and, and really achieve. Um, and you're right, many of the people who would have done all of the work necessary in order to achieve that were probably not thinking about going to the moon, the abstract mathematics that's necessary in order to calculate trajectories, et cetera, that wasn't done because of going to the moon. But at some point, to catalyze people for around a specific purpose and to be able to, especially for things that have all the benefits that you described early on, where there are you know, wealth creation, but also advancement of knowledge and all of the great things that come from pursuing these, um, I think they're all important and they're all very useful. When I think about specifically for us at One Qubit and quantum computing, uh, the efforts towards quantum computing have been around for a long time. The idea of quantum computing is from the early 80s. Um, but it was all very theoretical, and it was done in a context of pure research for a number of years. Um, at some point, it started to become something that people thought was on the horizon and at a point where it could leave the abstract uh, world and really be pursued very directly. Um, 
of course, sometimes these things take a little bit longer than uh, some of the, the optimists would think. And you always hear the sort of joke of, if I had known it was going to be this hard, I wouldn't have started to begin with <laughs> from people who have been very successful at achieving their goals. But I think that what's really exciting is to see when these things do become uh, within sort of the realm of possibility, being able to utilize the structures of all of these different groups that we talked about, from governments to academia to corporates, um, and of course just the sort of general funding bodies that support all of those uh, three different parts, um, to really push towards achieving these very specific goals. And I think that we're starting to see that, especially um, an understanding that once the research gets to a particular point uh, where specific applications can push forward, it makes sense to be able to develop these very specific efforts around it. And from my perspective, that's what a corporation is very good at doing. I mean, mm -hmm. our company is about trying to commercialize quantum computing and to build software for quantum computers. Um, it looked like a moonshot when we started. Now, because of the progress that's happened over the last few years, it seems very inevitable and it's something that's almost passe, but that's the process that occurs through focused research and application of this talent towards these very specific challenges. Hmm. Well, you know, moonshots projects, by definition, you know, are hard. So it's hard to plan, it's hard to predict, uh, and, and it requires many years of uh, you know, loneliness. Right? <laughs> and and the, well, taking you know, artificial intelligence as an example, you know, went back to 60 years. Um, six years ago, you know, uh, there, there are a group of people who believe, you know, in one day, you know, human intelligence, well, the machine intelligence, you know, will uh, be comparable to, you know, human intelligence, will actually help, you know, make people smarter. And they keep doing this for many years. And one time, it was, it was actually very embarrassing to tell people, I'm, you know, AI researcher, you know, uh, until probably 10 years ago, and, and uh, suddenly there's uh, you know, progress in, in algorithms, there's better understanding of human brain, there's a uh, uh, you know, breakthrough in uh, computation. So all the things uh, accumulate to make uh, the things that right now actually works. It works for you know, search, works for picture recognition, for face recognition, for voice recognition, and now it becomes a, a moonshot. Right? But still, it takes years, <laughs> many more years, to see this uh, at massive scale. Uh, so it really requires uh, patience, uh, understanding, uh, and um, commitment. So is there tension between that, uh, the timelines that are necessarily part of the private sector uh, uh, goals and objectives and some of the longer term patience that's required for uh, more fundamental projects? And how do we, how do we square that, uh, that circle or at least uh, make sure that everybody's in the right part of the of the continuum. Right. Well, you know, the, the world has uh, become a little bit different. You know, back in you know, 50s, 50s, 60s, you know, when uh, there was a Bell Lab. You know, ba Bell Lab was uh, very patient. You know, look at some of uh, the fundamental problems that could probably never find answers. Uh, I think it's sad we don't have a Bell Lab anymore. You know. uh, anyway. You don't have a mon monopoly anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but the good news, there are you know, other corporate research labs. You know, uh, well, there, there was a re Xerox Park. You know, there was uh, you know, Microsoft Research, you know, T.J. Watson, and also the company you know, I worked for, Davis Arnoff uh, you know, Laboratories. Uh, you know, those are some of uh, the pillar of uh, American innovation. But, but right now, if you look at the spectrum, it's, uh, it's, it's different, you know, uh, Google, mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft, uh, IBM, uh, Facebook are all doing research, actually tackling some of the biggest problems. But certainly, you know, they're not looking at anything that is uh, 10 years or, or 15 years on the horizon. Right? Even, you know, for Baidu, we're looking at uh, uh, the applications of some of the fundamental technologies. When we look at artificial intelligence, we look at how this could be uh, applied to uh, the things we are doing and the things we plan to do. Uh, example is uh, autonomous driving. Right? It, it actually requires uh, technologies and data and uh, research in many different fields to make that happen. But we believe it's, it could happen in you know, five years or ten years. So that's why I put a massive resource into that. Uh, you know, five years ago, we probably don't. So you know, to your point, it's the focus. Right? We do look at things that could be commercialized in the foreseeable future, and we make a big bet of that. But lots of those 
was rooted back to you know, the fundamental law of physics or, or mathema mathematics uh, and a lot of the research uh, back in academia. So are there examples of this public-private uh, collaborations that, that are really stand out as, uh, as models to emulate? Well, one example is in the uh, area of uh, self-driving, for example, which combine both uh, the uh, long, uh, long time scale uh, research, uh, the uh, challenge, sort of moonshot, and the uh, corporate involvement. So uh, this research has been going on for about 30 years. Uh, at the time where it was started, nobody, uh, it's a little bit like the AI example that you were giving, uh, nobody was thinking that this would develop to no. actual um, uh, application like this. Uh, the DARPA uh, Urban Challenge acted, uh, think of it as a mini moonshot, if you will, uh, acted as a trigger to migrate this uh, academic research to uh, corporate, which has now developed into uh, what we know of uh, self-driving mm -hmm. research in the corporate world. Uh, so this is an example of the evolution, but the important point, just like AI 60 years ago, self-driving 30 years ago was pure research. There was no uh, vision of, or no timeline of when this would somehow transition into an application or product. This was truly pure research. So this is an example of how that uh, you know, pure research is developing into uh, uh, something that moves to the corporate sector with some help uh, through a, a challenge from the government. So this is one that combines the three. And another example yeah. is the you know, internet itself. Internet the is, of course, the big example. You know, the original protocol is uh, mm -hmm. sponsored by DARPA or ARPA. And uh, in fact, uh, it became mainstream where there was a web browser you know, the, the, and, and the web browser and the HTTP protocol was uh, invented uh, from CERN, from Europe. Right, but see, that's an example, actually, of things happening the other way. Because Tim Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee now, uh, really wanted to help researchers be able to share their data. And, and without it being linked to uh, a specific machine-to-machine -machine kind of thing. And hence, you end up with the protocol and the, uh, and the HTML and so on that, that led to the World Wide Web. I mean, and there's a subtle difference between what the internet is today right. versus what it started out to be. And, and it exploded this, uh... because of what you said about the, the, broad, the broader web. Uh, the other is you have scientists who want to understand the cosmos. But in order to really explore, they have to develop very exquisite tools, including uh, very mm -hmm. precise uh, telescopes. Uh, some may be space-based, some may be land-based. And there's a lot of very intricate engineering and materials work and optics and so on that all play into being able to answer fundamental questions. So it, it, it's not always that a practical application drives basic research. A basic research question can drive the development of many, many technologies. Mm. So. That seems like a, a cycle that's very common. Um, and in a similar vein, um, I find that you know, thinking about corporations exclusively from the perspective of driving research um, as an employer of researchers, I mean, that certainly happens, but we've also seen uh, a, a great rewarding uh, new development of more venture capital from corporations, so corporate VCs and strategic partners. We wouldn't be able to do what we do with quantum computing without having the uh, backing of some of our investors who are really interested in understanding and seeing those applications unroll for their own benefit. And so it means that there's a, a very different path towards development that would be taken, for example, at one qubit than perhaps in a university, because although we're excited about the idea that we think quantum computers will dramatically revolutionize artificial intelligence in the long term, we're also really looking at ways that we can use them for optimization of financial applications in the short term. And it's by having these sort of very specific milestones along the way that allows us to generate revenue, to create value in an incremental sort of stepping stone pace. Um, and that's necessary in a corporate environment. When you have something like a much larger corporation, so like Bell Labs, they can look directly at sort of the, the, the moonshot all in one go, or something like CERN, where it's a very, very big problem that needs to be tackled all in one bite. Um, and corporations, I think, especially smaller corporations, need to be thinking about the incremental path towards these technologies, or how they get rolled out in a slightly more manageable way. Mm -hmm. 
Let's open this up for the audience, and, uh, and then we'll come back to our panelists for some, uh, some final insights. I think we have some roving microphones. Yes, sir. I think uh, we talk a lot about uh, AIs, right? So I have a question about AIs. And uh, I think I uh, read a lot of papers about AIs, but uh, I think I got a conclusion that in the near future, that AI cannot beat human brain. That, that could be a solution. But uh, my question is, how can AI uh, cooperate with human brain to, to benefit the whole world? Is there any kind of services to benefit the commercial area or the academic area uh, that we can learn faster or, or do the things better? I want to ask Mr. Zhang Yaqin. Okay. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there's a, a general you know, misperception, uh, a conception, in the sense that you know, AI is uh, competing or try to surpassing you know, human intelligence. Yeah, uh, replace the brain. Right. It's um, you know, uh, so so you know, I actually uh, have been to a lot of different you know, panels or forums. That there's a lot of uh, debate. If you look at the current you know, path approaches, uh, this you know, it, it's a, it's a it complements, right? It's an agent. It's a tool that exp expands from the human intelligence. It doesn't compete. And also, you know, looking at 20 years, 30 years, I don't think it will get there. <laughs> and the, the technology we have right now is very very different. We call it a neural network, but it's not the, the real neural, neural network, the neurons uh, in the human brain. Um, so you know, there's no concern, there's no worry that a machine is going to take over a human being. Uh, you know, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for many, many years. So there's no panic. Um, however, you know, I do have concerns in that what we are doing with a lot of the AI in you know, research or you know, the massive deployment in at the narrow sense of AI, uh, it certainly you know, helps. Uh, but with the, you know, in the next uh, you know, 10, 20 years, there are realistic, more realistic issues. Uh, you know, for example, uh, how do we make sure AIs, uh, you know, actually, by and large, the whole uh, big data and cloud computing, uh, all the algorithms, all the, the agents we design are controllable. You know, there, there are bugs, there are security issues, there are privacy issues. We want to make sure you know, things we design are meant to do the things we design. <laughs> so that is uh, something as mm -hmm. researchers we need to be worried. And the second thing is it will eliminate some jobs. Uh, and you know, we want to make sure, I, I, you know, I'm optimistic, better jobs will be created. Uh, but in the process, uh, there, you know, there, there are some positions, jobs will be gone. Uh, and the third, you know, in fact, I'm worried about the other problem. You know, when I see my daughter, you know, she doesn't remember things. She doesn't, she doesn't write you know, on paper. She, she types and she search. Uh, and when things go auto <laughs> autonomous, you know, driving and, uh, and you have this uh, you know, agent, uh, your, uh, the robots, you human beings are becoming increasingly dependent on automation and technologies. So you know, I just hope uh, human beings are uh, not become stupid. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So we should, uh, you know, should involve as intelligence evolve. Anyway, well, and I'm speaking in something that may be in more in Andrew's uh, uh, line, but but having intelligence in uh, algorithmic systems that control capital flows, uh, whether you're talking trading systems or things that can understand if something anomalous is occurring is very important uh, and, and can have a huge effect in terms of stability of financial systems. But I know people worry about uh, whether the intelligence will overtake human intelligence. But, <laughs> but there always is a solution and it's called unplug it from the wall. <laughs> because uh, in the end, we could charge uh, ourselves. <laughs> you know, because in the end, we, we have to remember that all of these uh, digital technologies relate to physical ones and, uh, and, and, and progress in that arena. Mm. And, 
and so we, we, we want to be sure that, that we understand that kind of fusion. And that's mm -hmm. why to talk about the uh, fourth industrial revolution is an interesting one. I think the work that you do in robotics is to me a, a perfect example of a, of a fusion. And, and, and so I'm interested actually in your point of view about yeah, some of this. Yeah, absolutely. Mark. Yeah, so, so in fact, from a robotics, uh, robotics standpoint, much of the work and much, much of the research does not so much have to do with the robots themselves or the robotic capability, but with the interaction with the human. That's right. Okay? How, how the system works with the human, how can mm -hmm. it uh, collaborate, understand human, uh, uh, um, uh, help, assist humans. Uh, that is the, those are the central, central issues that we, that we are dealing with. Um, the other issue that we are dealing with that is going to become more and more important uh, is the issue you, you mentioned in passing of uh, uh, trust, verification, certification of the system. Uh, we, we can go very far already, very, very far, uh, I think further than, than people imagine uh, in uh, the uh, autonomous capability of robotic system. Uh, there are two issues. One is to have those autonomous capability being usable with humans, not just in a, a, mm -hmm. a, a lifeless environment. That's number one. And number two, to have those capability be provably reliable and provably trustable. Now, there is an engineering science of complex system that has existed for a very long time with very established best practice. We do not have that for intelligent system. We do not have that for system that depends on AI or machine learning or computer vision or, or any type of robotics uh, system. We have bits and pieces of that. We have some uh, you know, practices that slowly emerge, but we don't have a, a, a engineering science of intelligent system. And until we have that, uh, we, we're going to struggle still to be able to use a very capable system. Mm -hmm. that, that's why I do agree that we are very far from uh, having seas of that, that nature. One thing that's interesting to me always is that people talk about when will machine intelligence surpass human intelligence, but um, I can't really do very complex calculations without my calculator. Uh, I feel like there's a huge uh, intersection between machine and human intelligence that's existed for a long time that we just haven't really thought of from that perspective. Um, and we're starting to be able to see these machines do more and more of the things that we used to do for ourselves to the point where maybe uh, I can't uh, dial a phone without using my <laughs> cell phone anymore because I don't remember the phone numbers because I don't have to. Um, mm -hmm. Now, of course, when we're trying to do things like applying quantum computers to artificial intelligence to make vastly more powerful artificial intelligence systems, there's lots of interesting things that can kind of spill out from that, and the autonomy that comes um, will certainly be interesting to manage. But uh, all of this really is about these incremental improvements that come along the lines, and there certainly are these big jumps, and I think a lot of the things that we see, uh, for example, the emergence of artificial intelligence as something that you no longer have to be embarrassed to research came from one of these uh, tipping points where all of a sudden it was able to do things much better in sort of uh, less and less narrow realms. And I think that's what we're about to see is an expansion of, you know, it's not just a calculator anymore, it's become much, much more capable. And that really does change the relationship that we have between the machine as uh, exclusively a tool um, to something that's got a little more of its own autonomy. But, but isn't it also true that there's some other fundamental questions having to do with things like von Neumann architectures, you know, the architecture of the data itself, um, and, and all of that has to come along, particularly when you're looking at uh, quantum computing, but even if you're not. Mm -hmm. Certainly. It's interesting that one of the things that's really happened in quantum computing is that the non-von Neumann architectures, the sort of the computers that are very different from the computers that we use currently, um, that research was originally done in Japan, in academia, but it was, it only became really mainstream with uh, a Canadian company called D-Wave that actually really tried to push this stuff forward to be able to build non-traditional architectures. And a lot of the work that happened to push current computers beyond uh, what we are familiar with really happened from a, a private company that was backed by some funding that was supplied by the Canadian government and also private investors. Um, and so I think that's another great example of where a combination of academia, 
business, government, and funding sources um, that sort of span across all of those things um, have led to a, a very new avenue for exploration that I'm personally very excited about. One more quick question. Hi. Um, so I also have a question uh, for Mr. Zhang from Baidu. So uh, I think one question we have about uh, private investment in those moonshot projects is that uh, we need all those data and also technology would be owned by the private sector. So I'm wondering, like, for you, especially in Baidu, I know recent month there are several crises and also a lot of people don't trust Baidu anymore like they used to be. I'm wondering, like, if companies that build those future technologies, um, if you lose this trust, how would how would this work? And also, uh, in the U.S. for AI, we uh, we know there is open AI, so that's a technology that's shared with everyone, so that it's not owned by one company. So, how do you address those issues? Uh, there's always a balance between, uh, you know, the privacy. Uh, and uh, the accessibility and the openness, accessibility of data. Uh, and uh, you actually raise a, a great, great point. So let me go back to your question. <laughs> but I want to just say a few, uh, so one thing also related to your question. Um, you know, when you look at you know, the PC web, uh, the data information were largely accessible. You know, it's all you know, HTML. You're able to search and find all the, essentially all the information. We get to the mobile you know, web, and we have uh, the native you know, apps. And actually, you find the information and data become more, you know, more guarded in the US and more in China. In fact, the search engine these days cannot, a lot of information you actually cannot find because uh, the corporate, the companies, they, they want to protect, right? protect the, you know, uh, their, the, the assets or the, or the data, which actually essentially from users. Uh, so as a company and also as a society, you know, I uh, advocate for continuing openness, uh, which is the, the true spirit of, of internet. And, and at Baidu, we actually open some of our, we can't you know, give data away that you know, those are users, but we do open a lot of our technologies uh, you know, in the form of uh, you know, API, in the form of analytics, uh, tool sets, uh, uh, to uh, developers uh, and the cu customers. Uh, for example, our mapping uh, information is open. Obviously, we cannot tell you, you know, who is in which area at what time. Uh, but overall, the, the high-level analytics, uh, that is, uh, you know, the POI data, all the things are open. Our speech recognition technology, uh, some of the modules are open. Uh, we have a, a platform called the Baidu Brain. Uh, that's the core of uh, you know, AI, deep learning um, technology. Lots of those are you know, open, made uh, accessible. And we're going to open a lot more technologies and, and data to the uh, level we can. And I also I hope other companies, other Chinese companies uh, and American companies can open more you know, data and, uh, and technologies. Um, and to the point of trust, you know, we indeed in the last six months or so we had a couple of uh, you know, crises uh, which have to do with uh, you know, the credibility of, our, of the information that we, we index. Um, and, and obviously we will continue to make our uh, information, to make uh, uh, our search results more reliable, more accurate. Uh, and, and also we recognize as a company uh, you know, we bear a lot more responsibilities. In, in five years ago, um, Baidu was a small company. And, and today, there's a lot more expectation uh, that from you know, the uh, users uh, and the government. Uh, and, and we will just need to continue to improve yeah, and do the better. I'd also want to add that mm -hmm. um, this is not something that's <clears throat> exclusively the realm of companies, that no matter where this research is being done, mm -hmm. thinking about privacy, thinking about ethics, thinking about the, uh, the unintended consequences, uh, this is something that needs to be considered. And so uh, oftentimes you'll see this be an issue for companies, but I think it's also often the case that companies are pushing the frontiers of the development here, and so they're the first people to break ground and to raise these questions. But it's not a company-specific problem. It's something that needs to be considered by all of the stakeholders we've been discussing. 
Marshall, jump in, and then we're going to do a quick wrap around your last profound thought. Yeah, to, to, ela to elaborate on, on this, the, so we, we talked earlier about the need to uh, access data, which is becoming, uh, of course, a critical uh, critical aspect of the research. But also, uh, there is to this to those points, there is a need to have uh, common platforms, common test platforms, and this relates also to the moonshots. Uh, when we talk about moonshots, we want to concentrate on the science. We want to concentrate on the research, That's and right. to get to that point. We need to pass the hurdle of all the infrastructure that is now needed yeah. uh, to get to that point. We cannot do that uh, in academia anymore. Uh, so we need those common uh, tools, those common platform, uh, test platform, data analytics platform, and so forth. Uh, now, of course, that's very difficult uh, for proprietary reasons, et cetera, across, uh, across the industry. Mm -hmm. But that's certainly the direction that we, that we need to go. Yeah. Shirley Ann, would you like to wrap up? We live in exciting times. It's exciting because we have exciting, talented people who are connected. And so the very mm -hmm. technologies that we're talking about are the same ones that allow us to collaborate and to do it globally. We educate our students the way we expect them to work. And so we educate them not only to develop these technologies and tools to make the discoveries, but then to use them in new ways. And, and so I think uh, the very fact that we're having this conversation <clears throat> says that we live in exciting times. John Pierre. Well, one, one point which has been touched by a few of the panel members, but also maybe coming from uh, questions from the audience, uh, has to do with the, uh, you, you phrase this by saying that the private sector could handle research. And a typical situation which could have happened, which didn't happen as much as some people feared, was the fact that some data would then become proprietary. For that was the case for the genome mm -hmm. sequencing, for example. Yeah, it was yeah. a very serious battle by the many people, actually not only the the science community to say that this should not happen. And of course, uh, I'm sure there will be no, uh, new domains, new issues, which will be where we'll be facing the same difficulty. Because then definitely making things uh, proprietary at the wrong place is going to be really hindrance to, to research. And therefore, I think we have to be very vigilant on such issues, because all of a sudden there will be all sectors which will not be accessible enough or not accessible in a way which is really optimal for further development, not only public, but even private development, private, because yeah. then it become too narrow and too restrictive. Mm -hmm. right. Marshall. Yes, we talked about moonshot in the, uh, primarily in the context of research. Another aspect of that, of course, is in uh, education and producing the next generation uh, mm -hmm. of researchers. We talked about rapidly expanding fields, AI, robotics, and so forth. Those fields are needing uh, more and more uh, uh, talent, and we need to define those moonshots in a way that will foster the education of the next That's generation. Right. That's certainly helpful for us because, you know, a small company, uh, we're at 50 researchers now, but all of those researchers are freshly out of those educational institutions, and it's really the process of education that's allowed them to come out and really hit the ground running, building the types of things that, uh, that we need as a private corporation. But I would say that the exciting thing for us um, is that last year when we were first at the annual meeting of the new champions, um, Quantum computing was really considered a moonshot. In the last year alone, so much has happened that we almost don't qualify now. People are sort of <laughs> like, isn't that done yet? You know, it's so inevitable. Uh, so I think it's, it just shows that the current approach really is working. Uh, being able to bring together all of the stakeholders we've been talking about has created tremendous progress, and I think we'll continue to do so. I'm encouraged by the fact that the system we have seems to be delivering amazing results. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. No, you great. Want, okay, right. Well, you know, uh, you guys made all the points. The last mm -hmm. one, I'm just we could make one more call for more investment in R and D, you know, for companies, for governments, uh, and for VCs. Uh, and R and D is the best uh, ROI. You know, looking at the short term and long term, you know, you have the best return. And right now, all the governments are trying to printing money, you know, quantitatively easing one, two, three, and uh, every government is printing of money. It's fine to use uh, some money to build uh, you know, railways, uh, you know, infrastructures, uh, communication network, but let's put some of this money into R&D. That's the best investment you have. Especially the R. Especially <laughs> the R. And, and especially in a way where we educate the next generation. Mm -hmm. 
Just one thing I forgot, yes. to, I forgot to say uh, in answer to some of the comments. I've never been ashamed of working on AI, by the way. I don't want to make that clear. Okay. Sorry. I'm proud. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a great end point. Um, I, um, I think we're all encouraged by the fact that there's uh, more engagement, more ambition, perhaps, in the way all of the actors are approaching some of these big ideas and moonshots. Very timely. A lot of new things are possible now um, as some of these uh, far, far away things become uh, closer and more realistic. Um, so more possible with technology, but of course our challenges are also becoming more complex and so, um, and none of us can do this on our own. So I think we heard some very thoughtful contributions on um, that it's absolutely essential that we build a, a moonshot coalition between the public and private sector to tackle some of our global challenges. Thank you very much to all of our participants, and I know you'll thank me for our panelists and their very thoughtful contributions. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon.